Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Authors At. Uh, my name is Kendra Commander. I am on the partnerships team at Google.org, focusing on access in the developing world. We have a very exciting talk today. Uh, we have author, filmmaker, entrepreneur, professional climber, um, Micah Bernhardt, um, joining us today to talk about coffee, education, sustainability in Ethiopia. Uh, I think you guys are in for a really, really big treat. Uh, it's a sort of combination of multimedia presentation as well as talk. Um, there will be some distortion, uh, perhaps in the, the quality of the video. Um, so please, it's not her fault, it's our fault. So um, welcome to the talk and hope that you guys uh, enjoy it. Thanks, Kendra. Let's get started. Do we have some video going on? Watch me. All right, how are you feeling? Anyone feeling a little anxious, a little scared, wondering if I ever catch my breath? Anyone want to go climbing? All right. <laughs> so let's take that edge with us for the next 30 minutes. So I'm going to start off. Anyone in this group Ethiopian? OK, zero hands are going up right now. So I'm going to give you guys a hint. I'm going to ask you that question again at the end of this talk. All right? And in the next, uh, before I do, I'm going to tell you three stories that I can guarantee are going to change your perspective on Ethiopia, adventure, coffee, development, and our role in the world. I do speak this fast. We have a lot to talk about, so we're going to get right after it. First, let me introduce you to Marsha Ade, his wife, Gete Tebo, and six of their seven children. Marsha Ade is a tribal leader of the Mesa tribe and lives on the flanks of Mount Urawalo, deep in the Amaro Mountains of Ethiopia. I wasn't looking for Marsha Ade exactly. I was looking for the best storyteller. I traveled for six hours that day by car and by foot, and for two days previous to that from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And when I got to Mount Urawalo, I walked through, like, it's basically the Switzerland of Ethiopia. You're walking through shocks of Kelly Green, false banana trees. The coffee trees, the wild coffee trees, are growing with such ferocity they seem to like, sprout new leaves and coffee cherries by the second. When I got there, I asked everyone, I said, who's the best storyteller here? And without long, I knew that I was looking for Marsha Ade. Marsha Ade lives in a home without a door that signifies his status as the head of the tribe. He's protected by everyone around us, around him, and he can also have full vantage point of the valley below him. So he knew I was coming to talk to him a full hour before I even knew who he was or where I was going. He was getting ready. He was taking all the furniture out of his home and putting it outside, covering it with skins and with furs to make sure that we'd be comfortable. And when I finally arrived, we sat down and started talking about coffee. Marsha Dre is a coffee farmer in one of the most rural parts of Ethiopia, which means he makes less than a dollar a day. However, he drinks a fortune every day in coffee. Coffee is so plentiful here in Ethiopia that people have coffee trees in their backyard. They have coffee forests in their backyard. And they drink coffee so much that if Marsha Day's personal coffee grove was getting top value in the market, which is about like $150, $160 a pound, he himself would drink $75 a day in coffee, which is a four-month income to him. That he's just drinking away in his coffee. So is he a poor Ethiopian coffee farmer, or is he a rich Ethiopian coffee farmer? Totally depends on how we're willing to look at Ethiopia, coffee, economics, any of it. Coffee in the Amara Mountains didn't come here from people, but it came here from nature. Wef zarash is a term for natural seed dispersal by birds and by animals in Ethiopia. And the coffee, as I said, is so plentiful in this part of Ethiopia that Marsha Day likes to say that there's no way for the cherries to leave the trees. His coffee accounted, is accounted for in legend in Ethiopia in the 10th century BC, but Marsha Day's ancestors didn't start drinking it until 3,000 years later in the 20th century. And the story is told that they were convinced that these bright red coffee cherries, if you would eat one of those, you would be burned because whatever was in it was clearly going to you know, explode in your mouth. And it wasn't until the mid 
what it was in the mid 1900s where actually traders came into the Amaro Mountains from the low, they came on camels from the lowlands of Kareda on camels to the highlands of the Amaro and started trading for coffee. And Marsha Day's ancestors were like, hmm, what's going on here? We thought they were going to burn you. And they waited until the same traders returned unburned before they started actually consuming that coffee. And once they did, it was off the hook. This coffee consumption is like anywhere in Ethiopia, three times a day, four times a day, multiple cups of coffee. That's part of the everyday culture there. Marsha Day told me this story while holding a bright red coffee cherry in his hand and handing it to me. And I bit into it. And when you bite into a ripe one, your teeth kind of pierce the outer skin. And I thought, what if this could be the best coffee in the world? What if this is the coffee that could also get that kind of value on the market? What would that mean for these people here? Marsha Day lives a half a drive away from any town, assuming you can actually drive on the roads. The roads are more often used as flat spots for drying coffee than they are for any sort of transportation. I was there, I was there when you're actually driving there, you have to stop and let people move some of the coffee away off the road because it's so unlikely to have a vehicle show up. I was there for four days, it was the only vehicle we had. We almost didn't get out because a huge flash flood came in and made everything a mudslide. So we could have been there for quite a bit longer before another vehicle would have been able to come up. As I said, the coffee topples over itself as it stretches up the flanks of Mount Urawalo. Marsha Day and I were speaking for about a half an hour at this point, and he was so excited because no one had ever asked him about his coffee. And to the best of his knowledge, no one had ever asked his ancestors. But he was sure, without a doubt, that his coffee was the best in Ethiopia. And when, I've actually never met anyone who thought differently about their coffee. Right? And we were speaking, and he kept telling me, my coffee's the best in Ethiopia. And by the time he'd said it th three times, he was saying it to me in English, because the translation had like computed at that point, right? And at that point, I said, well, we're going to have to have some coffee. We're going to have to really celebrate this. And he said, yes, but first we should kill an ox. Because that's a logical thing to do when you're pretty excited and you're in Ethiopia and you're thinking, well, we should have a celebration. But it's the afternoon and these clouds are mounting and, and actually grabbing the ox, killing the ox, slaughtering it, cooking it. This can take some time. We were a little bit pressed. So we decided that the alternative was that Marsha Day was going to dance for me. <laughs> This is his tribal, his costume for being the leader of the Mesa tribe that goes back seven generations. And at, this is his pre-coffee dance. He was really excited. So post-coffee, I mean, we're going to amp it up a little bit. And we went into his home to find out what post-coffee was going to be. And we walked inside, and Gete Table was already preparing coffee. So she had raw coffee beans. They were over a charcoal fire on a flat pan. She's roasting them. All of a sudden, like that sweet smell is infusing this earthen home. My stomach's growling. The clouds are building in the east. And then she takes those, those perfectly roasted coffee beans, she puts them in a mortar and pestle, takes her 30 seconds. I've been working in Ethiopia for 10 years. It takes me still about 35 minutes to do what it took her 30 seconds to do to grind those things by hand. Pours them into a thick-bellied and thin-necked jabena, a clay pot, puts it on the stove, and the smells just keep infusing sweet and citrus and honey. And I keep thinking, God, this is going to be the best coffee ever. And then this huge clap of thunder comes in and lightning, and everything goes dark in the home and I take one last breath and I run as fast as I can to escape a flash flood and I never had that coffee. 70% of Ethiopia lies between 2,000 and 8,000 feet in elevation. 50% of Ethiopia is incredibly vegetated, moist, dark volcanic soil. It's the perfect place for growing coffee. The images we're used to seeing of Ethiopia, dry, barren, desert, that's only a third of Ethiopia. This is the land where humanity began. And if you listen to legend, coffee showed up right after humans, and in fact, in the sixth century. Ethiopia has 10,000 different types of coffee, 10,000 unique flavors, varietals. And at this point, the estimation is that only half of them have actually been found, tasted, and cataloged. So 5,000 different types of coffees are still lying in wait in the forests in Ethiopia. That's incredibly intoxicating for any sort of coffee aficionado, entrepreneur, to say, what does it mean that this country, one of the poorest countries in the world, has the greatest supply of one of the globe's richest commodities? What can we do to kind of to push that together? What can we do to take those tastes out of the forests? Ethiopia 
over 60% of its foreign earnings come from coffee. If you gave every coffee farmer in Ethiopia 10 cents more, Ethiopia's annual income from coffee would go up by $60 million a year. But I don't think that's a really good idea. Because Ethiopia is also kind of this bastion, has been a bastion of aid. It's been the largest recipient of aid in sub-Saharan Africa since the 80s. It's been the place where fail great failures of aid have happened and great successes of current sustainable development. And if we go in from a coffee perspective and just say, let's pay more to Ethiopia because it's Ethiopian coffee and we bet it's good, we're going to be doing the same thing by going in with a blind eye. And I think what will be more interesting and what's starting to happen is to go into a nuanced conversation about nuanced coffee. So here we are in California, right? You all have probably been in restaurants or in cafes when you walk in and you actually get a bit of a coffee menu. And you know that there are different tastes. There are different flavor profiles for coffee. Imagine if you went to the best restaurant in Palo Alto and the coffee list was as big as the wine list. That's the potential we're talking about. And if we do that, then suddenly you're rewarding quality and taste and you're actually entering a complicated conversation, which is where things, in my opinion, start to get a lot more interesting. This is the, what we're used to seeing about Ethiopia, drought, famine, poverty. It's the constant and consummate negative trifecta. I think coffee can actually change this. And I think it can do it because I'm kind of, I'm kind of addicted to complexity. And I think that this is probably a crew, I mean, people at Google, I mean, it's, people are thinking, people are, are striving. And it's like, how can we actually, instead of going towards a simple life, how can we go towards a complex life in the way that we interact with the world? For me, it started simply with a free latte. We're going to go back in time here. So it's 2007, and uh, I was going to my neighborhood coffee shop, and there's this creepy guy outside whispering to me, which I'm not sure about you all, but whispering in public to strangers, not cool, right? Like, it's just not the way you make friends. But then walking into this coffee shop, and this guy's like, hey, free latte across the street. I was like, yeah, OK, that's great. You're weird. Just kind of move away. I'm going to go into the coffee shop. No, free lattes. And I said, but I don't drink lattes. And he said, but they're free. It's like, it's a pretty good point. And then I look across the street, and this kind of smoking handsome man was serving up the free coffee. So I was like, all right, the free latte is looking really good. So I cruise across the street. And uh, I'm lactose intolerant, so this is already not a good idea to be doing this. But I go up there, and I get a free latte, and I sit down, and I start eavesdropping on the conversation. It's a coffee company called Novo. They're in the front range of Colorado. And they start talking about a coffee called Geisha that was, at that time, getting $150 a pound on the market that's grown in Panama. And they're going on a trip to try to find the genetic roots of it in Ethiopia. It took me about 30 seconds. I stood up, I introduced myself. I'm like, do you guys need a journalist? Three months later, I'm in Ethiopia. When I got to Ethiopia, I understood about 0.003% of the coffee world, right? I was just, I was a writer. I was an educated coffee consumer to the best of my ability. I went into Ethiopia being like, local, organic, fair trade, those are what matters. And suddenly I'm in Ethiopia and I'm like, whoa. I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. This is completely overwhelming. And frankly, it was really scary for me. And so what I did is I turned to a part of Ethiopia that was way more comfortable for me. And that's because in my other life, I'm a professional climber, which I just got out of the Wyoming wilderness and the winds where I was climbing for seven days and I'm, we were laughing because I'm like covered in scratches and scrapes and, you know, because of, because of shoving my hands into granite cracks. So when I was in Ethiopia and I was scared about coffee and I saw a picture of these towers in northern Ethiopia, I was like, yeah, that's my home in Ethiopia. I'm going to go climbing in Ethiopia. An Ethiopian publisher caught wind of this plan. And they came to me with a plan of their own. And they're like, this is super cool. You're going to go climbing. You're a writer. Why don't you write a book about climbing in Ethiopia? I was like, yeah, that sounds great. And they said, and by writing a book about climbing in Ethiopia, you're going to save Ethiopia. So check it. Like, you're a climber. You're a writer. And someone tells you if you write a book about doing what you love, you're going to save one of the poorest countries in the world. Like, that's a pretty good deal. That feels pretty good. So I was on board. And the plan was that if I wrote this book, that millions of climbers would then flock to Ethiopia. And they'd change the economics of Ethiopia. So a little show of hands, who in the room is a climber? OK, cool. Who, any, everybody else basically knows what climbing is. How many of you have flocked to Ethiopia since my first book came out? Awesome. Everybody in the room raised their hand, just for you know, a point of reference. So I mean, it's hard to pass up, right? You think this could be a really good idea. And we got there, and we went, we showed up the Giralta Massif. This is in northern Ethiopia. It's never been climbed. We thought, 
We are so smart. Look at, we're so proud of ourselves with myself and a team of four other women and um, um, my friend Gabriel Gell was shooting photos for the book and we're like, no one's been here. God, they, you know, how silly everybody else is. How smart we are that we figure this out, that we're the ones discovering this. And you know, we're in this landscape in Northern Ethiopia. This is the site of the famine in the 80s. This is the place that was hardest hit where millions starved, millions died. They were affected by political power plays, food shortages, this is the heart of it in northern Ethiopia, and here we are climbing there. This is actually what pretty much created aid as we all know it in this room. Because in 84, you had this really unique confluence where you had the fact that crisis could be delivered direct to our television sets at home. You had a very affluent US, Canada, Western Europe, ready to help, ready to save things. And you had this dismal country entrenched in famine, and how could we not react? Most of us in, in this room were pro have probably been affected by that part in 1984. I was eight during the famine in Ethiopia. I was in Minneapolis where I grew up. I went to Montessori school, which is relevant because when Michael Jackson, Cyndi Lauper, Waylon Jennings, when they all like, got together and did We Are the World, at Montessori school you sing it like twice a day, right? It'd be like school assembly and we'd be singing it. And then it'd be in the afternoon and you'd be singing it again. And I was so inspired by Michael Jackson that I was like, I should write a song of my own. Right? I mean, if Michael Jackson writes about Ethiopia, I'm going to write about Ethiopia. I want to help a kid in Ethiopia. Nobody else can help this one. Here we go. Everybody needs somebody to see. There's three and a half more minutes of that. <laughs> I'm sure you all wish you could hear it. I will get it, make it available on, pop, you know, pop it up on my drive later on so you all can download it and listen to it or torture yourselves with it, depending on what you're thinking of doing. 23 years later, after I wrote that song, I was doing this in Ethiopia. And as I said, we thought we were, we were the smartest people in the world, that we figured this out. And it went incredibly well to climb, to put first ascents up on sandstone towers where you're shoving your hands and your feet into cracks and they're getting purchased and you're putting your equipment in, your metal gear, and you're clipping your rope in and you're pretty sure it's going to keep you safe if you fall. And it went great for like a day. And then it went horribly wrong. So here's the difference, right? It's going great on the left, it's a really cool photo. On the right, it's a really bad photo. Okay, this is sort of the difference in what happened. Because there was professional photographer Gabe taking photos when we were happy, and there was Mike is very scared and doesn't want to die in Ethiopia on the right side of the screen. Because what happened is this crack that we were following, we were trying to climb this 500 foot tower, the crack disappeared and suddenly we just had the face to climb. And, in, and the rock that we were climbing there was the kind of rock that if you went up, you could snap off the face holds with your, with your finger, with your pinky. You felt like if you just stared at it for too long, it would return back to its natural sand state. And that was all we had to go on when this crack ended. And it was a point for me in my climbing career that I was like, wow, I don't even know if I want to do this, but I'm writing a book about climbing in Ethiopia. And if I can't get beyond here, what kind of book is this going to be? And I ended up doing it. And we got to the top of this climb. And when we got to the top of it, I was like, OK, now what? How are we going to get down? And I'm probably going to have to do this again, because last I checked, it wasn't a children's book that I signed a book deal for. So I'm probably going to have to climb more than one of these things. And I'm scared about how I'm going to do it. This was the safe and known route for me, right? Like coffee was supposed to be overwhelming. Climbing was supposed to be what would be easy for me. And yet when we got down from climbing this tower, we did a first ascent on that. We started hanging out with a family at the base. And this is a 14, excuse me, a 13 year old girl with her four month old daughter on her back. So here I am thinking about exploring a country through climbing, through opportunity, through adventure. And then on the other side, I'm looking at one of the highest needs for maternal health care in the world. How do you put those things together? And how was I going to put things, those things together in the book? And the only way that I figured out how to do it was to get comfortable with what I now think about as like the middle place, where some things make sense and some things never do, where that climbing and that need for maternal health care can go together. Back in 2007, I never thought I would go back to Ethiopia. I thought I went there, I had a really good time, I spent four months, I wrote a book, but then I went on a speaking tour for 50 cities when my first book, Vertical Ethiopia, came out. And I tried to tell these really big, complex stories about Ethiopia from that middle place. And what I saw is that people wanted to know more. And they would come up to me afterwards, and they would be like, hey, so about that coffee? 
What, what's the deal with that? Whatever happened to that? Like, have you ever gone back and thought more about that? And pretty soon I saw that two things were going on. Number one, people really like coffee, right? Like that's kind of obvious, but it became very clear to me at that point. And number two, we're sort of obsessed with Ethiopia. And part of that is like, if I had written my first book about like the Ivory Coast, it probably wouldn't have been on a 50 city speaking tour. But we've all been trained to pay attention to Ethiopia from global media, in part because of what happened in the 80s, in part because it just became this like relative point for us to all cast off of in its aid center of gravity, but also because of the ancient Oxumite Empire, Haile Selassie. It's the only country in Africa that was never colonized. It has this rich history. People, we've just been taught to pay attention to it. And I started thinking about, well, how can I leverage that for Ethiopia? What's going to be the most interesting and enticing way that I can do it? And I went back and I was back in the States. And uh, this is not Ethiopia. This is New Hampshire, which is where I went that winter to go ice climbing in 2008. And while I was there, I was like, I'm going to go back. What's my plan? And I decided that I would go back and write a book about coffee and culture and connecting those two things to try to tell a broader story about Ethiopia. And then something else happened. I got a phone call. This is Imagine One Day. Imagine One Day is a Canadian nonprofit that is basically a leadership development powerhouse in Ethiopia, veiled as an education nonprofit. And Imagine One Day had this idea that they were going to go into Ethiopia and sort of support primary school education. And that's how they started out. But last year, they were working in Bale, which is in south central Ethiopia, and they're working with their teachers. And they weren't, they had, you know, they're working on what they're going to teach in schools, but they're also doing this whole life skills training. So they're talking to them about communication skills, about goal setting. And these teachers flooded the Bali chapter of the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia and opened bank accounts the day after this life skills training happened. So much so that the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia called Imagine one day and was like, um, who are you? What are you doing? We've never had teachers open savings accounts like this in this area. Imagine one day up in the north of Ethiopia, they have this great scholarship program for high school kids, right? They wanted to work in primary education. Now they're giving scholarships to high school kids. And they're doing it where they're like, you, you're super motivated. So I'm going to give you a loan. Because in, in Ethiopia, to go to high school is basically like going to boarding school. Because you're going to have to travel. You're not going to have it in your remote village. So in order for you to have the money to go to school, we're going to give you seed money, get your supplies, and we're going to give your parents a loan to buy a really skinny cow. And then your parents are going to feed that cow, and they're going to have a whole animal fattening program. They're going to sell that fat cow. They're going to save some money. They're going to buy some more skinny cows. And at the end of four years, these parents are going to have actually financed three years of that kid's high school education. And the one year that Imagine One Day did is going to be forgiven. This is a program that this was never their intention, right? This was completely outside of their wheelhouse. Like, what the heck is a nonprofit focused in education doing fattening 177 cows and opening 497 bank accounts and working with schools and going, into some of, going to some of the poorest people in the world and saying, you want a school? That's great. Help us pay for it. Asking the poorest people in the world to actually spend money. And that's part of what Imagine One Day does. They're like, what do you want? Can you help us get there? And what they've seen is a resounding yes from these communities in Ethiopia. Like, we want to help. You have communities who go and petition the cement companies nearby and say, we, want, we really need a road. And those communities created that road. It wasn't Imagine One Day who did that. It was the community. And you know, there are examples of this happening through of this happening throughout Ethiopia with these nonprofits. And part of it is because you have this confluence. So many people flooded to Ethiopia in the 80s and the 90s, and so many people were doing a very large and messy version of aid that it was bound to happen that people were going to start getting streamlined and working towards sustainable development. When Imagine One Day gave me a call in 2008, we were like, we need to work together. Because what we're both trying to do is somehow change the conversation about Ethiopia. And you know. We're here in the US. There's like a pretty international crowd in this room and the people that I've talked to already. Like we all know what national identity is on a global scale. That countries are misrepresented and misunderstood constantly in our world and truncated to become smaller and easier to digest. And we thought if we can help change the conversation about Ethiopia, where are those conversation shifts going to be more important on the global scale down the road? I've since worked with Imagine One Day. We've like combined rock climbing, education, coffee, eye care, all these different ways to keep blowing it out. And you know, I work, a lot of nonprofits will approach me and they're like, we want to work with you. And one of the first questions I say is, are you willing to go outside your wheelhouse? 
Because nonprofits have, a, have had a focus for a long time about saying, this is the one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm focused on foot care because foot care is the way that people are going to move around and it's going to, what, whatever my mandate is. But if there isn't collaboration, if people aren't saying in order to do this, then I need to work with the schools and I'm going to work with the healthcare systems, then these things die. And these things die a really long death that gives aid a, the bad name that it kind of had. And it's really fascinating to me that if you take a country like Ethiopia, that was once, like I said, that largest recipient of aid in sub-Saharan Africa, like what if it could kick total butt on sustainable development and be the leader for that? Wouldn't that be one of the greatest things to come out of what's happened in Ethiopia in the past 30 years? It's not super easy. And one thing that I will definitely admit is Ethiopia is not a perfect country. I mean, you can't, no one in this room can come up with a country that's perfect, right? But that's sort of the point. And I like to think as Ethiopia is like the ultimate doppelganger for like all of us in the world, right? And if it can succeed, then we can succeed at this complexity. And for me, that all comes back to coffee. And the reason it does is because in Ethiopia, you have 80 languages, 200 dialects, 10,000 types of coffee. Multiply that all, do some extra numeric, get to infinite numbers of stories about coffee and complexity. And in Ethiopia, when you drink coffee, you drink it, you drink it as a ritual. You drink it as a way to celebrate your culture. And the stories that are, there are about, this is a guy named Gebru. He lives up in northern Ethiopia. And he told me that when he was growing up, he was told if he drank coffee, he wouldn't make it to paradise or heaven. And the proof from his parents came in the following story, that when Jesus was killed, coffee didn't mourn Jesus properly. So when Jesus was killed, the earth went into mourning. So the rivers were dry, the trees were completely barren, the, wa the, ri uh, excuse me, the wind was still, but the only plant that kept growing was the coffee plant. It sprouted new leaves, it had fresh cherries. Coffee, as Gebru says, didn't cry for Jesus. So he wasn't, allowed to, he wasn't allowed to drink it when he was growing up. He told me the story over a cup of coffee in his mid-40s. So clearly, we've moved on from this. He thinks he still has a decent shot at paradise. But most of the kids in his generation you know, didn't drink coffee growing up, but then kind of moved on to having it when they got older. A couple hours south of where Gebru is in northern Ethiopia, on the shores of Lake Tana, there's a place called the Zege Peninsula, where in 1307, Bishop Abuna Miriam gathered his flock of people and they settled there. And they said, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive? And he said, don't worry about it. And he took his prayer stick and he broke it across his, his leg and he planted one piece in the ground and he broke it again and planted two more pieces. And he said, come back tomorrow. So everybody came back the next day. And there were three crops growing, coffee, hops, and lemon. And the bishop said, made his people promise that those were the only crops that they would ever have on the Zaga Peninsula. And to this day, this is in 1307, to this day, those are the only crops grown on the Zaga Peninsula. And they're transported across Lake Tana on these papyrus boats every day. Coffee origin stories abound in Ethiopia. Like I said, we have the multiplier, right? I mean, a, a friend of mine once said that if you flew over Ethiopia and you had a lot of, lot of gentle darts, you know, just like little stickies or something like that that had a little traction, and you just dropped them, Every place they landed, you'd have a new story about coffee in Ethiopia. And that's probably true. Have any of you guys heard of the story of like Kaldi? So Kaldi is a, there's a very famous story that, you know, if coffee can't, comes from Ethiopia, there was a guy named Kaldi. He's Christian, he's Muslim, he's a delinquent, he's a scholar. There's lots of different variations. The bottom line is Kaldi saw some goats having a really good time. And he's like, that looks fun. And he went and was like, wow, they're having fun because they're, the, they're eating coffee. So he started eating coffee, brewing coffee, boom, coffee. Kaldi is, most stories, is from Kaffa. Kaffa is a region, um, the kind of kingdom of Kaffa in the central Ethiopia. And it's a great, like, onomatopoeic li link to say Kaffa coffee, which is not actually true. It's a really cool story. But coffee, the word, comes from the Arabic word kawa, which is a drink made from the brew. There's a great story about the 7th century coffee being discovered by Prophet Muhammad's grandsons. His mother was giving them a bath and she tossed their bath water out the window and the next morning a coffee forest had sprung up there. And that began the Muslim ritual in Ethiopia of using coffee beans for ceremonial purposes. There's a story about an ox that smelled really good and he started coffee because he smelled good and people want to smell as good as the ox. 
there's no right story. And that's part of the beauty of the way stories are expressed in Ethiopia. And when you have coffee, that's your time to share that. Coffee is usually drunk in a three-step ritual called a coffee ceremony. So when I was with Marsha Day, the coffee I didn't get to drink, Gete Tebo, his wife, was making the first cup of coffee, super, super strong coffee. And once we all had that, she'd pour water into that same pot and re-brew it, and then we'd have a second weaker cup and then a third weaker cup. And in the Amaro Mountains, if you show up in the first cup of coffee and there's an unmarried woman who's in that house and you cross the threshold during the first cup, she's yours. Marriages have been brokered over that. You show up during the second cup of coffee, nah, it's a little iffy. You're pretty suspicious to that family. Third cup arrival of a stranger means peace. To drink coffee, to drink three cups of coffee, right? Not just slam them down, but to drink three cups of coffee takes time. And that time is sort of how a lot of Ethiopia transactions have been brokered for centuries. And, you know, I like to think about Ethiopia that in four miles you can have seven different languages, right? And how do you, how do you work with that kind of diversity? I mean, it's sort of a microcosm for what we're dealing with in the world right now. And I like to think that in Ethiopia you deal with it by sitting down and taking time and drinking three cups of coffee. Because if you spend that much time with other people, you work through differences. This is a country that's 60% Christian and 40% Muslim and largely harmonious. It's kind of amazing that Ethiopia has existed the way it has with its complexity and yet been as stable as it has. I would, of course, like to tell you that that's completely because of coffee, but that might be an unrealistic claim to put on there. Taking the time and settling down for someone like myself when I go to Ethiopia is always hard to remember to do, to be like, I'm gonna sit here and not have a fast cup of espresso that I can have if I just go around the corner. But if I do that and I get thicker with it, then where can I be as a complicated person? And that's kind of what I wanna leave this conversation with. Because in the beginning I asked you all, who's Ethiopian in the room? And no one raised their hand. But I think that if being Ethiopian can mean embracing complexity, that we might all be willing to be Ethiopian. And if we as a group, if we can work, if it's just with coffee that you want to take out of this conversation and go into your local coffee shops, go into your restaurants and say, where's this coffee from? Tell me a story. But don't just tell me the good story. Tell me the big story. Tell me the good and the bad. Identify coffee, not just with, well, there's this really nice coffee farm and they don't make quite a lot of money, but they really care about it and they have really great children. I don't want to hear that story. I want to hear the stories about like what matters to that community, what's happening in that world, because we have access to that through the people who are working in coffee. So let's push them a little harder and let's push ourselves a little harder to tell these big stories that are scary, that come from that middle place. So I'm going to ask you all again. We all come from Ethiopia. It's the cradle of humanity. But if being Ethiopia means being our best complex selves as human beings, being curious, having full conversations. Who's Ethiopian in this room? Right on. Thanks very much, you guys. I'm doing a new project right now in Mozambique, and I was laughing with my friends in Mozambique saying, we're going to be Ethiopian in Mozambique. And all my Mozambican friends are like, what the heck are you talking about? Like, what, you know? I was like, no, because we're combining, I'm climbing at the, um, this 2,000 foot granite big wall, so a pretty big objective from a climbing standpoint, and bring scientists up on it to find new species of ants and geckos and beetles and bugs, and then starting a new conservation area, and it's all in Mozambique's second highest mountain. It's like, sort of insane to put all those things together, but it's been really fun and it kind of like, it keeps getting richer with all the layers that we add into it. But I've been made fun of quite a bit by my team in Mozambique by telling them to just embrace their inner Ethiopian for it, so. My favorite story of coffee in Ethiopia? Yeah. I think one of my favorite stories is there's a woman named Asnakich Thomas and she's the only female miller in Ethiopia, which is quite a distinction. And she's worked really hard to kind of create this, this especially coffee there and she'll you know make sure that things are being separated out and she's following them all the way through the process so she can watch the unique profiles and one of the main reasons she wants to do this is because she's lost two sisters um, to fistula and to basically early death from child when they were going through labor and maternal health is has a lot a long way to go in Ethiopia and there's been a lot of work done. And when you talk to Asnakic and you can get her to that point and you're like, why are you working so hard? She's so innovative. She comes up with all these brilliant ideas. She's been a cheesemaker. She made wedding cakes. She you know, grew castor plants and now she's thriving in coffee. And she's like, I want coffee to create a hospital in Amaro to, so that people like my sisters don't come home two in a box. 
And two in a box means mother and child together in the same box because they died during childbirth. And it's not an origin story of, of coffee, but it's like the passion and like that she can see that coffee has the potential to do that in her home is really amazing. We had an author a while ago who was talking to us about uh, the Bordeaux region in mm -hmm. France mm -hmm. and in like all of the different things they do you know, like to make their wines what they are and in like half of that is technology but the other half is you know like just the, the practices that they use to to to, to grow and and to you know like to win the wines mm -hmm. is 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 there you know like are there things that you know like these people could sort of transfer from that from the know, winemaking like, culture from the winemaking culture i mean if we're talking you know, like a wine list of you know like in a restaurant mm -hmm. you know, like, and we're talking now coffee list i mean it seems like there's, there's quite a bit there's because stuff. it's you I mean, know it's all about it's a family business in in bordeaux you mm -hmm. know like, i mean it's a very family business thing it's you know like they're they're keeping the big players out so to speak which i think may be important in ethiopia if it well it's interesting because ethiopia was sort of forced because of what was happening in ethiopia in the 70s and the 80s from a regime standpoint i mean you basically had you know the derg this communist marxist bloody bloody regime you everything was forced to not industrialize and I mean, in fact, that was one of the tenets of the dirt. But because of that, you don't have these. It's not like you're going to Brazil and you have coffee being processed at that level. It's really small lot differentiation can still happen. And right now, there's been a lot of there's um, you know, it's 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 kind of the classic evolution. There's the Jima Research Station that does all this research on the morphologies of different coffees and what's going to make them thrive. And when they first started doing the work, they would re release these ascensions and they would take a coffee from like central Ethiopia and they'd be like, this is great. And then they'd shoot it over to eastern Ethiopia and it would just fail miserably, which now we, we would all look at it and be like, well, of course it failed. But when they started, you know, they were thinking, well, we're, we're making a very drought resistant, beautiful coffee that is, con you know, it always tastes the same. And now it's like, no, no, we need to make the best Harar coffees from Harar. And then what do you do to take care of them and there's lots of experts going in working with the experts in Ethiopia and saying you know what is the best soil situation what's the best forest canopy how do we do this and then the question becomes if small lot co coffee is actually going to be the wave of the future which I would argue it is it's very elitist it's very expensive but it's the same thing that happened with wine like you had super expensive wine and then eventually it trickled down and you have that differentiation and if that's going to happen then the hardest thing is that you know when I show up with my bag of cherries from my trees I have to like watch that bag of cherries then go through like all the processes so that finally we know when we taste that beautiful lemon where it came from and so, you know, that's a pretty big commitment, but there's a lot of structure going into place with that in Ethiopia. So it's, it's very exciting there right now. It's complicated to get coffees out of there sometimes because of the way export trade happens. I mean, I'm sure you all at Google run into, like, how do you work with Ethiopia as a company with its, with its laws? My first book that was published by an Ethiopian publisher actually had to be purchased from cousin of the publisher in England to be shipped out of Ethiopia because they didn't have like, they were like, well, we can't just have a book on loan out somewhere. We have to purchase them all. It was just, you know, it's crazy. So I got into export, you know, policies when I was a writer. Who knew? Are there any major players like exporting coffee? I never really hear, I mean, maybe you do, but. Major players exporting coffee yeah. in Ethiopia or like yeah. which countries or which out companies? Out of Ethiopia. Yeah, so there are Ethiopian um, companies, but usually they're partnering. I mean, you have the whole range. You have someone like, um, you know, Blue Bottle Coffee, right, in San Francisco. Those guys are great. They do a really good job with small differentiation. You have Starbucks. Starbucks has massive power in Ethiopia, not in like sketchy power away, but in like legit. I mean, they can do some, have made really big changes in Ethiopia because of being able to work with such a big group of people and then work on some of that. So, I mean, every, most major coffee companies, um, be it something like Starbucks, be it something like Intelligentsia, be it a company like Novo in Denver, they have a relationship in Ethiopia. And, you know, now the big thing a lot of people in Ethiopia are trying to do is actually, um, not just export green coffee, but export roasted coffee, so they have a little bit more control over it. The problem is that when you're exporting roasted coffee from Ethiopia, it's like if you're gonna roast it and then drink it in a couple days, it gets a little bit murky with how you're gonna do that with large amounts of it. Yeah. I realize I should show you the, that the photographer's names, because they would, they would love it if everyone knew that the beautiful images are not mine, because I'm lucky and I get to work with great professional photographers. So you touched on politics a little bit in Ethiopia. Are, is the political situation in Ethiopia such that the development that you're talking about can actually happen, or is the politics getting in the way? Great question. You know, Ethiopia has a goal itself that it wants to be a middle-income country by like 
2050 or something like that. It's an incredible goal, right? It's, it's actually a little bit insane if you really think about it, which makes it really beautiful. And so actually the Ethiopian government is, depending on which initiatives you're working with, education is one of the things that they've really set out as a mandate to go after, which is one of the reasons Imagine One Day chose to work in Ethiopia, because they're like, we're going in, the government really wants to buttress e education, so we're going to be able to work hand in hand there. Um, so, you know, it depends on what kind of development you're trying to do. And, you know, I mean, when you step over into like press freedom, Ethiopia is not, you know, if it's like, let's make more journalists, that's not really going to be supported that well right there. But um, same thing with like internet access or the way that, that texting works in Ethiopia. Um, but with, I think that one of the things that the Ethiopian government is really trying to spearhead is, is actually wanting to be that progressive. If you set a mandate that you want to be a middle interim income country in a very short amount of time, then you're going to have to be willing for people to get in and kind of get grisly and dirty with how they're going to do it. Um, and they've been really supportive, I think, to a lot of uh, sustainable development groups. Sustainable development is one of those things that's almost becoming a phrase that doesn't mean anything anymore. And I think that's really unfortunate because it's a big difference, right? Sustainable development and aid are like on other sides of the spectrum. And I'd love to see us have that word not fall away and become like, nah, whatever, but actually like support that word and ask people what it means, like what, what it means to extract yourself from somewhere, what it means to have that, you know, these schools support themselves because they have, they have, income generating strategies for schools. There's this great group I work with called Himalayan Cataract Project, horrible name for a group working all over the world. But um, they do eye care. And when they do eye care in Ethiopia, I mean, they've trained tons of nurses and local surgeons to do these cataract interventions so that they come in and bolster it and more numbers happen. But you know, it's being self-sustained in Ethiopia. How are you seeing sustainable development work out in Ethiopia? Like coffee has a really long history and tradition, especially Brazil, of really not being sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so like, are there organizations or how are people learning to become sustainable farmers or build a sustainable yeah. coffee chain? So that's, you know, when you bring up Brazil, it's sort of Ethiopia's blessing because of its history, because it wasn't industrialized, because it wasn't using massive amounts of chemicals, because everything wasn't getting poured in the same place. It kind of has a bit of a weird advantage to that. But there's very much, um, like when we're talking about sustainability on that level, there's a lot of work being done to that. It's really, it's been really difficult in Ethiopia. Like, I mean, it's probably the same thing in the Bay Area, right? You have a really small farm, they want to get an organic certification. The money they have to pay to get an organic certification is really prohibitive. So, you know, there have been, different coffee companies that will go in and be like, we'll, we'll pay, we'll cover this. Or you guys get your Rainforest Alliance certification and we'll help you work through that because the rest of the world wants to see that stamp and wants to know that you're going through those practices. I would say that a lot of the coffee grown in Ethiopia already sort of falls under sustainable practices, but it's about actually being co um, cognizant and focused on continuing it as things start to get industrialized. And also as things as money starts coming in for coffee, because once you get more money, it's like, let's grow the coffee faster. Let's get it going. It's like, whoa, actually, we need to go the slow way because that's going to be where that value is going to come in. So there's a there's a fair amount of agricultural support. I mean, it, it's an agrarian country, so you have that. And it's, it's an interesting thing because there's actually a lot of intervention from China right now, especially in the roads and the telecommunications industry in Ethiopia. And then as that starts to bleed into agriculture, where those kind of sustainable um, mandates where they hold up and when they don't. And it, I'm really curious to see where Ethiopia is going to fall on that in the next couple of years. Um, how does fair trade play into the economics of coffee in Ethiopia? And what do Ethiopians think of fair trade? My favorite and least favorite question. Um, so fair trade, fair trade is complicated because fair trade is like this great idea, right? Like, and I use it as an example when I first went to Ethiopia. I'm like, fair trade, organic, let's go. And then you kind of, when you get into the nitty gritty of it, you realize that fair trade can sometimes be a limiter, right? Because fair trade sets a price and then sometimes those farmers can't get more than that for their coffee. So it kind of has this back end um, limitation involved in it. So in Ethiopia, fair trade initially was seen as something that was really great because it meant that you got a little bit more money for your coffee, right? But now it's seen as, as like, how can we make fair trade more flexible? because that's how fair trade has to evolve to be most effective for some of these products as opposed to saying, you know, I mean, fair, 
the fair trade price does fluctuate depending on what the commodity price is, but it doesn't allow for the price to be like crazy because all of a sudden people tasted this one coffee and thinks, think that it should get $95 a pound. It doesn't accommodate for that. So how can we kind of use fair trade would be my recommendation and use, like it has such a hold over people. It's amazing, right? Like we all kind of, like we see it as a stamp, but like when you buy things, you're like, oh, it's fair trade. It's probably better. It's been really effective at its marketing. And I would say like if we can, if fair trade can keep evolving so we can use that mind share it has, then it's going to be the best circumstance for Ethiopia. You mentioned the harmony between the Muslim and Christian communities in Ethiopia, you know, like in, in almost all around the world, you know, like there's some trouble in, in between the two. What's, you know, like what's the, what's the secret sauce? I think, I think the secret sauce in Ethiopia is that it's just mingled, you know, like I have friends, I love my, I have a good friend named Teddy Baranu who I've worked with on probably seven different projects in Ethiopia. And Teddy just like tells it how it is. This is a guy who at one point was pulled over by some militia dude with a big like a machine gun and he walked out and he was so mad that he went hand-to-hand -hand combat with this guy, got rid of the machine gun, tied him up, put him in the back of his car, drove him to the nearest police station. Like that's Teddy. Like he's just like, he's like, Ur, you know, but he's like kind of this little really nice, nice guy. And uh, I always ask him about the Muslim Christian thing and he's like, Michael, whatever. Like I grew up and you know, it was my birthday. We would have my birthday and then it was like, oh, you're fasting, but I'm not fasting, so I'll make sure that you know my, your Muslim father cuts the meat for you, and then when I come over, I make sure that your Christian neighbor shows up and does what I need to do. And like there, it, I think that there's just been so much integration that it's worked really well. On the flip side of it, there are parts of Ethiopia where that's not happening, and there's parts of Ethiopia where that tension is being prodded. And that's really unfortunate because you know there are sometimes there are reasons for tension because of you know the way that assets have been allocated, land's been allocated, but I actually think that quite a bit, because of its position in the Horn of Africa, other groups are going in there. There's a big insight in, from the Protestants group trying to be like, let's stir the ashes, let's feed the fire a little bit. And if anything, that's the thing we should be fighting to not happen. Um, because it's, I think that it's like I said, there's so much diversity in Ethiopia that it isn't really about if you're Christian or if you're Muslim. It's really about like, well, what else you got? Because there's a lot of more things that make us different. And so it becomes less relevant within that. And you just have that, ma that mapping and continuous overlapping. Please give a hand to Micah.